very much. I appreciate it. Welcome back to the broadcast. P.T. Barnum once said, there's a... something important today for a change, like war, women against uh, restricted restrooms. You know, wherever you go in this country, from the nation's capital to the world trade center, right here excuse, with BBS, excuse, there are long lines for women from a number of people. who got arrested, arrested for using a men's room. Yeah, now that is absolutely ridiculous. Would anyone in this audience like to be arrested for using the closest facility? Would that be I mean, come on. Ladies, how I fooled you, I fooled you, hold on. Let us go back, there you go. April Fools, April Fools, you can let her. <laughs> we knew that was gonna happen, you know. <laughs> As I was saying, P.T. Barnum once said, there's a sucker born every minute. Well, it's our bet that even P.T. Barnum would be amazed at the number of people who are deceived and tricked by hoaxes today, just like, uh, how many people thought that was for real? Yeah. <laughs> War women against restroom, what was it? <laughs> Bring her back, I was very curious. <laughs> Is it for real, uh -huh. Espiola? Come on, honey, you know it's better than that. <laughs> Now, ho hoaxes can be harmless pranks, like that one obviously just was, or like the ones you uh, pull on April Fool's Day. But on the more serious side, they can be well-plotted, devious schemes that range from falsely accusing someone of having committed a crime to wrongfully impersonating someone, or just plain outright academic, financial, or scientific fraud. How gullible are we as a society? Today, we'll find out as we meet some notorious hoaxers. Meet, for example, Howard Koch. Now, I don't know if uh, we should call you a hoaxer, but he was the mastermind of the greatest hoax, perhaps, of the, of the 20th century. He's the fellow who wrote the famous Orson Welles radio broadcast, War of the Worlds. As you know, that broadcast triggered a national panic. People really thought the Martians had landed in New Jersey. It was a wild one, and it was so real that it was incredible. Now, uh, the next story didn't set off a national panic, but the story covered by New York Times reporter Craig Wolf did set off a racial panic of sorts. It was the notorious case of Tawana Brawley, the young black woman who claimed that she had been raped by a band of white men in upstate New York, including some police officers. Now, that case uh, really, in many ways, tore apart this state, and it sucked in unknowing people like Governor Cuomo of, uh, of New York, comedian Bill Cosby, the boxer Mike Tyson, all of whom wanted to get involved to help out poor Tawana Brawley in a case that was later revealed to be a hoax. Our next guest, Cheryl Ann, tells us that she was the victim of a hoax of a different beat. She read in a tabloid newspaper that her ex-lover, Peter Chris, now he was the former drummer for the rock band Kiss, uh, had become uh, a homeless alcoholic. Now, deeply moved by the plight of her former boyfriend, Cheryl Ann flew Peter across the country to help him get back on his feet. But the guy who stepped off the plane was this imposter, Christopher Dickinson. Now, you see, Christopher is a real-life homeless alcoholic person who says that posing as the former Kiss drummer was the way to get attention and a few hot meals because he was desperate, we'll hear how Cheryl Ann reacted when she heard that Chris wasn't Peter. Frank Shorter is a name that's familiar to every runner in this country. He's the guy who started the jogging craze. He's also the victim of a colossal hoax back in the 1972 Munich Olympics. Just one lap away from becoming the first American since 1908 to win the marathon, Frank watched as an imposter, a guy who hadn't run at all, crossed the line ahead of him and claimed Victory. So Frank will tell us how he reacted when he heard the fans cheering wildly for a guy with a pot belly who was uh, sprinting out ahead of him. Now, everybody remembers George McFarlane. There he is in our satellite screen, better known to millions of Little Rascal fans as Spanky. There he is. Spanky, who joins us via satellite from Irving, Texas says that he and Buckwheat and virtually all of the original cast of The Little Rascals have been impersonated at one time or another. Uh, you may have heard of the Buckwheat imposter who recently fooled ABC's News Magazine 2020. Well, 
uh, that does not sit well with Spanky or the other surviving members of the Little Rascals, as you can well imagine. We'll talk to Spanky about that. And of course, you can't have a hoax without a hoaxer. Alan Abel is a professional hoaxer who devotes his time, energy, and money to fooling America. His credits include uh, putting a woman up to claim she was the winner of the $35 million lottery, and uh, it was a phony. He also uh, fooled Craig Wolf's newspaper by placing his own obituary in the New York Times. And Alan, wasn't the young lady from the Women Against Restroom Discrimination? She was your plant also. One of our group. One of your group, okay. <laughs> Uh, I have very uh, ambivalent feelings about uh, Mr. Abel. I have to warn you, you know, he is also a guy who fooled uh, some of my colleagues in the talk show business by having some of his, uh, his plants faint in the audience. So if anyone faints in this audience, please don't be concerned until we feel their pulse, you know. Uh, I hope no one actually does it now. They'll be lying there and will be appearing insensitive. Today's program is the world's most famous hoaxes. That's the focus of this edition of Geraldo. We've put together a video piece of some of the world's greatest hoaxes, including, and you may recall this, uh, the Howard Hughes biography written by Clifford Irving, and then Howard Hughes, the reclusive uh, billionaire, surfaced and said, no, the whole thing was a put-up job. Those and others are featured in this background video piece. Let's take a look. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. Halloween 1938, when a radio broadcast of H.G. Wells' classic science fiction thriller, The War of the Worlds, touched off a tidal wave of reaction. It began as a holiday prank, but turned into mass panic as Orson Welles reported the landing of Martians on Earth. I'm, of course, surprised that the H.G. Wells classic, which is the original for many fantasies about invasions by mythical monsters from the planet Mars, should have had such an immediate and profound effect upon radio listeners. As easy as it was in 1938 for the media to fool the people, today it's the media which is sometimes deceived. Fooling reporters has become an art form for media satirist Joey Skaggs. Well, there is an organization now, a new one here in New York, that says it can help. It is called the Fat Squad. Six Fat Squad commandos are here now, this morning, live to maintain tight security around our Good Morning America refrigerator. The Fat Squad is a hoax we were had. Uh, as were many other respected newspapers and broadcasters. She looked at me, and we both started smiling. I thought, oh my God, it's over. The curtain has to come down. Studio guest Alan Abel revels in the vulnerability of people, and like Skaggs, exploits the media to express his message. His recent claim to notoriety was the creation of a fake lotto winner. This actress would tell the cameras how lucky she was to win $35 million. I had a dream. Um, I dreamed that Malcolm Forbes and Donald Trump were surrounding me in a magic carpet, and they told me the numbers. Remember when Howard Hughes, the reclusive billionaire businessman, supposedly allowed author Clifford Irvin to write his biography? Well, the publishing world got red in the face when that biography turned out to be a phony. Girl, you know it's true. And the music world proved its own vulnerability to hoaxes when Grammy Award-winning group Millie Vanilli was exposed as two lip-syncing imposters. When our gang's buckwheat was discovered living in Texas, 2020 told the sad story of this one-time famous child actor. What 2020 apparently overlooked was the fact the real buckwheat had died 10 years earlier. After upstate New York teenager Tawana Brawley claimed she was raped by a group of white men, her case quickly became a cause celeb for activists like the outspoken Reverend Al Sharpton. The case led to a long and expensive investigation and fueled racial tensions throughout the city. But no proof was ever found to substantiate her case. And the conclusion was, the rape was a hoax. Hoaxers can certainly embarrass or even substantially harm their audience. But every now and then, these pranks can turn a dull day into an event. And that's exactly what happened when Gorbachev showed up on Donald Trump's doorstep. 
Mr. Trump is coming now. He's just that? come down very briefly. We, we were on our way. He wanted a couple of minutes. I like honor. your tie. Yeah. I like my tie. Yeah. Right yeah. color. Great yeah. honor. See what? Thank very you. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. I hope we didn't disturb your schedule. No, it was beautiful, and I heard, and I couldn't have been happier. Very good. I couldn't have been happier. <laughs> so even Donald Trump gets busted. Uh, Laura Lammers, is that your last name, Laura? Now sits in our front yes. row. Was it your idea, Women Against Restroom? What was the other R for? Women Against Restricted Restrooms. Restricted Restrooms, that's yes. it. Well, uh, good luck with your cause. Uh, <laughs> actually, our security guys, uh, where's Bobby? Bobby, come on out here a second. <laughs> come on, I, I, you know, he's a crack uh, detective, formerly with the New York City PD, now the head of uh, the security unit here. Now tell the truth, what did you think when you saw her? Gotta throw her out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you really were fooled. We had no idea. <laughs> that shows how good they are. No, I don't know. He's a, he's a great guy. Uh, I was, uh, I was convinced. But uh, Alan, I, I tell you, the, uh, I, I, I mentioned my ambivalence about what it is that you do, and uh, although I can laugh, obviously the Gorbachev thing in front of uh, Donald Trump's hotel uh, is something to watch the high and mighty full on their noses, but. Uh, don't you think that you're impeaching the credibility of the media and making all of our jobs more difficult by what you do? A absolutely. It keeps you on your toes. I think it's necessary in between the axe murders and the serial killers there should some be some levity in the news. And we provide that. Our merry pranksters will go out on a slow news day and we do it for fun. We do it in order to give people a kick in the intellect, make them laugh, make them think. There's no greed. There's no fraud involved. We're self-financed. We have private backers. Backers. Who, what backers? Who's going to back you well, to go one, and pull a prank? All right. One of our backers, unfortunately, passed away a few years ago. Was the founder of the Book of the Month Club, Maxwell Sackheim. Oh, there's nothing you say I'm going to believe. <laughs> Better believe it. <laughs> all right. How about? Uh, uh, let me just flash yeah, a couple another things. one. Up here. This is uh, the uh, prior to la launching the the uh, Moscow. Uh, remember the landing, Martian? We did that in Moscow last year, a year ago. This is the actual uh, spaceship that went up. It was just a weather balloon. And uh, it was provided, it was covered by TASS. I'll just show you a quick, a couple quick. Here's Edie Amin marrying a Connecticut wasp <laughs> in order to gain I asylum. I didn't even get my invitation to that one. I've well, loved it. I was in go. all the news. You've already shown the headline with Lee Chirola, who won. Uh, these, these are just headlines. These are, I did not fake these headlines. This is a full headline in the San Francisco Chronicle about clothing all naked animals for the sake of decency. Now, wait a second. Is that a real headline? That's that a real headline, along with the Donahue fainting audience, where all of our audience fainted on Phil Donahue's show. A, well, why not? He was talking about gay senior citizens. He, he had just... I've fallen and I can't get up. He had, he had just... He had, just arrived. All right, all right, all right. Enough, just enough. Cool down, cool down. Now, so, but, hold it a second. Okay. <laughs> Spanky, you don't think these things are very funny, do you? Uh, I, uh, I don't think them funny at all, Geraldo. Now, you guys have not only been uh, embarrassed, you've also been hurt financially, haven't you? By people saying they're you and getting paid for various engagements? Well, uh, there, there have been those instances. There, uh, I had one instance uh, happen to me in uh, California several years ago where there was a very imaginative gentleman who over a period of years uh, purported to be me uh, and uh, went into a lot of, uh, of motion picture and television production things, uh, leasing and, uh, and renting equipment from various people to do various productions that never, that never happened. Uh, and all this time I was getting the bill. So yeah, uh, financially there have been some people uh, hurt, although not particularly me. How about in emotional terms? How did you react when 2020 ran the profile, the very sympathetic profile of, uh, of your former colleague, Buckwheat? Well, uh, I really wasn't surprised. Um, well, maybe that's wrong. I, I was surprised. I wasn't shocked. Because this has been going on a long time, Geraldo. Not only with me, but with uh, Buckwheat, with Porky, uh, and a lot of the other kids that I worked with in the Little Rascal Hour Gang. Uh, but um, what it, it makes me very mad. It makes me very, very angry uh, to think that somebody would do something like that. Uh, apparently, a lot of these people have no higher calling in life uh, than to try to be somebody they're not.
Well said there, Spanky. And doesn't he still look the same? He still. Like, I just miss your beanie. Where's your beanie, Spanky? Well, I, I fought a losing battle with the mob. Oh, the high sign? Here's that high sign. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> Spanky, I want to know, are you still a member of the He-Man Woman Haters Club? <laughs> uh, secretly, uh, Geraldo. Uh, my wife doesn't know about this affiliation I have. Howard Koch, the uh, immensely talented uh, genius who scripted perhaps radio's, uh, well, most controversial moment, but uh, also one of its great moments, at least in terms of the believability of the drama. But did you make it, Howard, too believable? Uh, mine was an unconscious hoax. Uh, all I was trying to do was to take a far-out idea and make it as dramatic as possible. But I had no idea of what was going to happen as a result of it. Did you not know, though, in the hours leading up to the broadcast, and indeed during the time the broadcast was on the air, that people were reacting so dramatically? As soon as it went on the air, I was exhausted and I was asleep. They tried to wake me up, Orson Hausman, and uh, I, was, I was out of this world. I was so... <laughs> out of this world? Oh, wait, why not? <laughs> The next morning, I was walking up 72nd Street from Riverside Drive, and I heard all the sounds around me, people, bystanders, saying, invasion, war. And I rushed into the barber shop. I said, are we at war or something? <laughs> and he held up a, a newspaper, Martian Invasion Broadcast Panics Nation. Well, that was a very strange moment in my life. What was your reaction? Chagrin, embarrassment, pride in an unusual way? Well, at first, because we didn't know what was going to happen to us, because the police came in and took all the scripts except mine that I had in my apartment. And uh, uh, it was a question whether they were going to be villains or heroes, very close. And then Dorothy Thompson came out with an article saying we had done the country a favor by alerting them to what could happen. And uh, that turned the tide, and, and then we went into more money, and Campbell uh, became the new sponsor. And finally, as a result, we all went out to Hollywood, Orson and John Houseman Houseman, and I. Orson Welles, and yourself. Yes. And so it had a positive effect on your career then. It surely did, yeah, and still is. Howard Koch, you should know, also co-wrote probably the greatest movie of all times, Casablanca. Can you... Howard, can you remember some of the incidents, some of the things that happened? I mean, groups of farmers getting together, pulling out their shotguns and their pitchforks, looking skyward for the incoming enemy? Yes, we went down to Grower's Mill uh, for the 50th anniversary. Grover's Mill was just the Four Corners, and now it's a very famous town. And, and of course, uh, was ground zero in the invasion. Yeah. They, and how it happened to be Grover's Mill was pure accident. I was riding down on the west side of the Hudson River through New Jersey, and I realized I had to have a map if I was going to plan this campaign, Martians against us. And uh, it was a New Jersey map. And when I spread it out to begin my campaign, uh, I just closed my eyes, put pencil down, Grover's Mill. I thought that sounded very real, very good. Uh, well, now people are coming, they tell me, from all over the world to buy dirt where the Martians didn't <laughs> land. <laughs> that was amazing. Yeah. You know, uh, I could talk with you forever about that. It's such a fascinating story. I, I want to jump, though, for a second to Frank Shorter, the man who pulled off the impossible against all the odds and all this great international competition at the 1972 Olympics in Munich, Germany. Uh, there he is about to pull off the racing coup of the century, or certainly since 1908, and someone in front of you. You hear the crowds cheering ahead of you. I what was, do you think happened? I was going into the tunnel, and I heard a, a big cheer. 
because uh, the last lap is running the stadium. The last lap is around the stadium, and you come from outside the stadium at the end of the marathon, 26 plus miles. And I heard this cheer, and I said, well, maybe the high jump's going on and someone's cleared a height. And I came through this tunnel, and traditionally, one of the loudest roars in all the Olympics is when the marathon winner comes out onto the track. The whole stadium erupts, so I came out onto the track, and it was dead silence. <laughs> and I started around the track, and someone fr in the stands who was an American said, yelled out, don't worry, Frank. And I thought to myself, why should I worry? I'm an American. Uh, and then as I got further and further around, people began to whistle. And, and whistling in uh, Europe is booing. It's like booing. It's insane. like booing. And I thought, gee, give me a break. I mean, you know, I've run all this way. <laughs> and, and finally, as I, as I started around down the back stretch, you go one lap around the track, I saw a big commotion around the finish line. I saw them grab somebody. And then it, you know, it, it kind of dawned on me what, what had gone on. Someone had come and Shades of the Rosie track. Ruiz, remember right. her? That nice. what, what year was Rosie? She was in the Boston Marathon. No, right? Rosie a uh, couple of times, New York and Boston. Oh, she, she did it uh, twice? Yeah, yeah. Although radio obviously demands imagination. You have to create the images. I think many of us are uh, a little skeptical or at least don't quite understand how that broadcast could seem so real to so many people. We thought that in Howard's honor, in Mr. Koch's honor, we could play you just a minute of that radio broadcast, the original Mercury Players broadcast of H.G. Wells' classic War of the World, starring Orson Welles. Let's listen to the reaction of the people when the Martians were landing. Go ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most terrifying thing I, I've ever witnessed. Wait a minute. Someone calling someone or something. I and see, turning out of that black hole through a luminous disk of the eyes, it might be a face, might be almost oh, a heaven, something wriggling out of the shadow like a gray snake. Now it's another one, and another one, and another one. They look like tentacles to me. That, oh yeah, I can see the thing's body. Now it's large, it's large as a bear. It's glistens like wet leather, but that face, it, it, ladies and gentlemen, it's indescribable. I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. So awful, this. Eyes are black and they gleam like a serpent in the mouth is a kind of V-shape with saliva dripping from its window. Okay, get finger. out the gun, oh, Mabel, they're here. <laughs> That's Monster, enough. Okay. It, is, can hardly move. Uh, it was it's amazingly realistic. Yeah. Incredible. <laughs> Craig Wolf, did you ever believe that Tawana Brawley had been abducted and raped by a gang of uh, white hoodlums? Absolutely. Uh, when I was first assigned to the story, I went up to Wapringer's Falls, about an hour north of New York City, and I was looking for the person or persons who did it. Um, in fact, uh, the, the paper uh, went after this case and committed the resources it did to the investigation because we thought it had happened. Uh, it was only after, well, a relatively short time, really a few days, when the facts were not really holding together and the tra trails were turning cold. Okay, give us some of the red flags that really tweaked your reporter's uh, curiosity. Well, the, the story as it came out from the family of Tawana Brawley and her advisors and lawyers was that she was found in a plastic garbage bag outside the apartment where her family used to live and that she uh, had racial slurs scrawled on her and seemed to be the victim of a horrible rape and attack. Uh, the first and most important thing to know is that she was not found in the plastic bag. She was seen crawling into the bag. Um, the fibers, the material that was used to write these racial epitaphs on her torso, uh, these were burnt cotton fibers, were actually found in Tawana Brawley's fingertips and indeed in the fingers of her gloves. And I could go on and on like this. It's also important to know that just as she's being discovered, just as police and ambulance and neighbors are converging around her, just at that point, Tawana Brawley's mother, just a few yards away but on the other side of this small apartment complex, is driving away and goes to the local police station where for the first time over Thanksgiving weekend, reports her daughter missing. Now, we wrote a book about this, and clearly, 
while the mystery is enthralling and engaging and so forth. Our purpose was not merely to write a, a book about a young girl's lie. Uh, the purpose of the book was to highlight how this case was a kind of litmus test or a barometer somehow for the, for the racial tensions in this country. It is important to point out that for a whole lot of people in this country, the Tawana Brawley case is not a hoax. There are a lot of people who believed it happened because it was plausible. It happened against a backdrop that made it seem plausible after all, considering the racial problems we have in this country. We wrote a book that tried to address both her lie and the, the larger problems. The fact that to so many people it could have happened, however horrid and however racist, it's, it could have happened. Geraldo, it's the, it's the most heinous kind of hoax. We're talking about all kinds of hoaxes because it, it taps in to our worst social fears and that's what made it so plausible after all. It is also one other point I'd like to make is that if there is any link between all these disparate kind of hoaxes, it is that the media always has to be on watch for um, uh, to not be lulled into the usual mechanism of checking out facts. You know, the phone rings in the office, you have a source, you get cracking on it, maybe you confirm it, you become so you feel comfortable knowing you've done your job, but but maybe there are times I know as a reporter you've got to take a second look. Right. You know. Your yeah. proud papa's here in the audience someplace, isn't he? Yeah, my Where's mom he? and dad. Oh, mom and dad, stand up. Come on, stand up. Well. <laughs> yes, he is. Mr. and Mrs. Wolf. And, okay. And we're very pleased to have Ann Koch here. Where is Ann Howard's lovely wife? Why don't you stand? Ann? Come on. She is. A writer in her own right. She wrote the, uh, the Robin Hood series for uh, British films. She's been uh, Howard's maid, Marion, for how many years now, Howard? Uh, 30. Uh, 50, but who's counting? <laughs> 50, 30. Uh, I came at 6, I came at 8. Like you were on time. I was late. I remember it, it well. It seems like 30. That's right. Okay. <laughs> the world's greatest hoax is our focus. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Do you ever feel bad about it, Howard? Uh, about the Martians? Well, uh, no, I don't think I did for the reason that I hoped it would, it would uh, teach a lesson that uh, we can be manipulated. We can be manipulated not only with a, if we can in a war as absurd as that one from another planet, how we could be manipulated with wars on right here on our earth. And that was to me a, some lesson to come out of it, which I hope was absorbed by people. I understand the illusion. <laughs> so Ann, tell me, uh, Tell me how you reacted when you read in Star Magazine that uh, the man you say was your ex-lover, Peter Chris, the drummer, the former drummer from the rock band Kiss, was uh, a homeless derelict in the West Coast. Oh, I was so upset. Um, I think it was the worst day of my life. My mom was with me the whole day, and I tried for hours and hours to locate him. And finally I did uh, at the end of the day. How'd you find him? Um... I had made several attempts of calling all the, the shelters and the missions and all kinds of places that uh, the star had written he was going. And uh, finally, I decided the best place to, to go would be to call the, the writer of the star story. And finally, I got him. And at that point, he told me that uh, Peter was on the other line. And he came back to the phone and said, Peter wants you to call him right now in Ontario. Ontario, so the, east California. of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, you sent him a ticket. First class. First class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you paid for it? Yeah. And your motive? To get him back on his feet. Um, I couldn't even believe that someone who'd been in my life years ago could be so hard up and desperate. And I wanted to get him back uh, with somebody who cared about him and get him an attorney and get his money back. Your reaction then when instead of... Peter coming down the jetway, you see Christopher Dickinson. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I had requested something called privacy assistance from the airline, thinking that it was indeed Peter. 
and uh, I had security there, and uh, at the phone booth, I noticed a guy that uh, looked like Peter from the back. He turned around, and <laughs> it was Chris. It was not Peter. And your reaction? Well, I first wanted to beat the hell out of him, but then, <laughs> then I decided he had to be pretty desperate to fly cross country, knowing I'd, I'd certainly recognize him the minute I saw him. Chris, you knew that she would recognize you the minute she saw you. Why did you think you could pull off this preposterous hoax? Basically, I was pretty uh, loaded. I was pretty out of it. I understand you got pretty loaded in first class also. Yeah. You got kicked off. Got kicked, kicked off the connecting flight. Got kicked off. You were kicked off the flight. You were so drunk. Yeah, in Chicago. Yeah. 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 I was I mean, don't you feel to... embarrassed? Uh... Yeah. I mean, there we have a split screen of, uh, of the hoaxer on the left, the real guy on the right. And we know that uh, Peter Chris has uh, really responded to what you did uh, in, a, in a very emotional way. He, he, he blames you for uh, you know, him being barraged by people saying, what the hell happened? Had you fall into the gutter? I mean, don't you have any sense of conscience about that? Yeah, I do. Um... I do feel bad at this point. I really do. Well, for a long time, I really have. I mean, can you play the drums? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. OK. <laughs> yeah, all right. So. <laughs> and Cheryl Ann, you know, when, uh, when uh, Peter, Chris, was told the story, your story, he says that you and he never had a relationship. Yeah, what that happened? That you were, uh, you know, just fishing to wheel mm -hmm. in a groupie yeah. uh, or a rock yeah. star. No, what happened was, the last time I saw Peter, um, there was a, a club that was owned by a former management company of his, and everyone in the industry used to congregate there. And uh, as I have just recently found out, we dated eight years ago, and he's been married 11. So he denies in print that he knows me, but he takes my phone calls real quick. <laughs> and my mother has called his house also. Well, for the record, Peter is not here to give his side of the story. I think the heart of what is being said here, though, is indeed the Christopher Dickinson hoax. So what has happened to you since, Chris? I tell you, I've got to take a commercial break, and then we'll finish that line of thought. <laughs> Alan Abel mentioned my good friend and colleague uh, Phil Donahue's name as being the victim of his fainting hoax. Uh, I want you to know that Phil is not the only one. Uh, you know, Oprah has been victimized by hoaxers. Uh, uh, Sally uh, Raphael has been victimized. And even here, believe it or not, we have uh, been embarrassed. We've done, I think, 800 programs on three different occasions that we can think of, as you'll see right now. Take a look. The first incident came after a very serious program looking for homes for homeless couples. One of the couples, though, turned out to be fugitives, running from a robbery charge. And shortly after our program, they surrendered to authorities. While investigating the unusual subject of male virginity, two guests planted on our panel turned out not to be what they claimed. Whatever these characters are, he was not a virgin, and she was not his sexual surrogate. The question I have for you is, why did you lie to us? Why did you present a phony tape recording to us? Our final embarrassment came during the taping of a show called Blood Money, when I came to believe one of our guests brought a fake recording of a phone call supposedly made by his wife to his life insurance company. He claimed she was trying to increase his policy before she attempted to kill him. Apparently, she did later shoot him, but she never called the insurance company. During the show, we contacted them to find out our guest tape was a scam. How can you USBA. sit there and lie bold-faced to me right now when I'm telling you that we have caught you, that the tape recording is a phony? I was angry. Don't make Geraldo angry. <laughs> So what do you think of uh, Howard Koch's classic broadcast? Did you I hear it? I loved it. As one hoaxer to another, I would like to ask you two questions, sir. First of all, what prompted you to put this show on the air? Uh, it wasn't my idea. It was Orson Welles' idea. And he wanted it done not as the short story had been written, but he wanted it done in the form in which you saw it, which was... Uh, news bullet. In other form. words, reality wise. Right. Yeah, it was his idea to do it that way. Why? Why is that? Why, why, why do you, why do you why? feel about that? Well, why do I feel about that? Why? Because what? we want to do an exciting show, and that would be more exciting than than doing it uh, in third person and just uh, something happening in the distance. You didn't like that? 
Well, weren't you afraid of the repercussions it would cause? Uh, what happened in your family? I never thought about My it. My family was hysterical. What do you mean, frightened? Definitely frightened. Yeah. Uh, they were scared green. My sisters ran under the bed. Yeah. What did you do? I was kind of young, but I ran with them. Uh, did you look out the window for the Martian? No way. I wasn't going to go to that window. Uh. Nothing doing. So you kind of mad at uh, Howard and Orson and the Mercury players? Not actually angry. It was a good show. I, in fact, I... In fact, if it comes back again, I'm tend to listen to it. <laughs> hey, be right back. Stay with us. So, I'm sorry. It was Eddie Murphy's portrayal of Spanky on Saturday Night Live. Remember that, Eddie Murphy? Oh, Tay Panky, you know. It, I, I wonder, Spanky, how you felt about Eddie Murphy's portrayal of, uh, you know, of Buckwheat? Well, you know, without without uh, getting into sour grapes, uh, Geraldo, I. Uh, I didn't like it, number one, I'll be very honest with you. Um, I thought it was a bad portrayal. Uh, the man obviously didn't do his homework because Buckwheat never said Ote. Porky was the kid that said Ote. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, and so he built a, a talk about uh, a hoax. Uh, he built a, his whole thing on, on Ote about it, uh, with a saying that, bu that Buckwheat never used. Um, but uh, I, I didn't like it from the standpoint that that he finally, his, his, uh, uh, his buckwheat thing finally got into like um, a, really a, a, a making fun of type thing. I see. And, uh, you and thought he was Buckwheat's disrespectful. character in, in a bad light. And I didn't think that uh, that needed to be done with somebody that can't fight back. Right. Okay. Uh, the gentleman on the right, I want to know Alan what got is. you started doing hoaxes? Alan? Well, it's, it's my way to retaliate against the injustices of our times. Uh, we're all reduced. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure that was exactly no. your motivation. We're all reduced to Social Security numbers. You, you have no rights anymore, and you want to get just a little space in life, like crossing the street. I use this to get traffic to stop. <laughs> and if a cab tries to run me over, I just flip the sign. <laughs> and it's, it's practical. Practical. I want to quickly go to, uh, to Laura and to, uh, is it Phil in the front row? Excuse me? Uh, Laura and, and Phil, yeah, well, uh, two of your Laura operatives. Is one of our Mary uh, Laura, tell us some of the other hoaxes you've pulled off. Uh, well, just, what was it, a few months ago, four days before the Taj Mahal opening, we went up to Boston, rented a... The Taj Mahal is Donald Trump's casino in right. Atlanta City. Right. We went and rented a conference room at the Ritz-Carlton and called a press conference in which I impersonated Marla Maples. <laughs> we had members from, from all them? over the country. Uh, yes, I fooled several of them, we made national press. Uh, it was in the New York Times, the Herald, the Globe, yeah, the Times Channel gets 4. burned again. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Paul, what well. are some of your greats? Uh, well, last year at this time, I was one of the infamous lotto hoaxers. Uh, we are, we are How much did you win? Pardon me? How much did you win? I didn't win nothing. I just got drunk as a skunk, basically. <laughs> and uh, we staged a party over at the Omni Park Central. And as far as hoaxes go, it was really pretty easy. I was also one of the... Uh, the uh, Phil Donahue fainters. I was number two to faint. Uh, for that, we formed an organization called Fight Against Idiotic Neurotic Television, or faint. <laughs> and uh, basically, we went unconscious. Who pays, the race. You? Who pays you, Paul? Oh, we don't get paid for anything, really. I mean, we just. Are you employed otherwise? Oh, sure. What do you do for a living? Um, I have a part time job in marketing. What, what, do, you, what do you market? What? Uh, books. And I'm also an actor. You, you mean you stand on the corner and you sell books, or how are you working? <laughs> no, I do it, you know, the exciting world of telemarketing, if you will. Telemarketing, <laughs> I see, I see. What do you got there, Alan? Uh, well, I want to show this is a public people pooper. Uh, when Paul and I went into the Helmsley Palace Hotel, they wouldn't let us use the restroom because we weren't registered guests, so we built our own toilet on wheels. <laughs> and we took it in front of the hotel for people who were not registered guests. <laughs> uh, Craig, without meaning to sell, sound uh, self-righteous, I think that uh, the media uh, reporters are in search of the truth when they're at their best. That makes them vulnerable to fraud. I think in the Brawley case, there may have been the problem at the beginning, but I'd, I'd like to say that the New York Times and our book set out always to put it in context, and I think, in fact, we were the ones who actually sort of brought some light to a very provocative case. Christopher, whatever happened to you? What are you doing now? <laughs> Nothing. Are you still are you still presenting yourself as uh, Peter Chris? No, no, no. Frank, whatever happened to the German kid who posed as the winner? 
Well, I think this speaks very well to the press. What happened was no one reported his name. You'd have a heck of a time finding out who this person was. The media, as soon as they realized they'd been taken, buried him. Usually they rush to report the name, but here, no one knows what happened to him. I think he went back to school. Thanks, everybody. Spanky, thank you so much. See ya. Good luck. We love you.